Okay, just um, yesterday, um, the president revealed uh, his eight-point agenda for this new administration, courtesy the finance minister and the coordinating minister for the economy, Wale Edu. And um, notable um, of all these are the eight agendas, which are food security, ending poverty, economic growth and job creation, access to capital, improving security, improving the playing field, and um, rule of law, and fighting corruption. Yes, we've heard this before. Uh, somebody once said that um, agendas are the same from government to government. Maybe they just come in different words and different you know, uh, nomenclature as the case maybe. But this is Tinobu's eight-point agenda. And um, he has promised his body language. And then um, the charges he gave the ministers as being to be bold, to be courageous, and to come up with meaningful policies that can drive his agenda. And so we're looking at the eight-point agenda of um, President Tinobu, even as he approaches the first 100 days in office. And then... Um, Idaosa Osamaze is right beside me to take a look at this. Now, Idaosa, the talk is, do we even need an eight-point agenda? Some will say, why not just have one-point agenda, which is to get better as a country? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, media has a way of uh, giving meanings to, to words. And I think uh, what... Um, it's real doubt is not different from what the president has been saying all through his campaign, even through his inauguration speech. And for me, is uh, his understanding of the fundamental of the challenge that we all face today. That when we're talking about food security, we're talking about issues to see how do we feed our people, uh, such that uh, when there are um, natural emergencies that uh, we don't run out of food and. Uh, even if there is a global issues that we are still able to have food to eat because that's also critical. And uh, you have seen that, of course, a lot of people also get into crime because um, uh, hunger is also a motivation because every human has this uh, self-defense um, uh, instinct that uh, when you are pushed to the wall and uh, you want to find how to survive, the survival instinct in man will always want some people to take to enemies to survive, uh, as it were. So making food available for people, I think, is something that he has spoken to. And that was why when, of course, he was talking about the revised issues on the palliative, and he said one of the things that he was going to do was to create some agriculture hubs yeah. where people can have some mechanized farming, where state is going to partner with some uh, private farmers, big-time farmers, to ensure that there is adequate food on the poor man's table. Because the only reason why I are sitting down here is uh, to be able to get a three square meal. Yes. And so the food has to be on the table, and that's one of the agenda that the president needs to guarantee that everybody had good food to eat. I want to see that the economy is robust. Now, there are a whole lot of things that is making the economy to stagnate, and some of them are stemming from government policies, and uh, especially the fiscal policies of government. And you see, of course, the government has inaugurated a committee to look at the tax policy in Nigeria and see how to harmonize and synchronize the policies such a way that, of course, too much burden is not placed on businesses and the businesses are allowed to breed. Because it's only when businesses breed that the poor can actually breed. <laughs> now, you see, this is, these are the issues. Now, there are also issues that have to do with security, of course, which, of course, a, a lot of people argue that people can't go to farm because of insecurity. Now, you cannot actually create an environment that will be friendly for people to come and put investment on your ground without providing security for those investments. Now, if I'm going to put money and say I'm bringing somebody to come and invest in Nigeria, I should be able to assure that person that your investment is safe. I'm going to assure that person that, of course, there will be no disruption from Lucas and all of all these things. So the government has a responsibility to put all of all these things in place. And so what we're talking here or calling it agenda is the governance approach of this new regime. That this is what we're going to uh, look into to see how to oil the wheel of the economy so that it all flourish. And this is one of the issues for me which is... Um, very, very heartening. The only item here that, of course, which the president has not spoken to, whether in the manifesto, was the fact that the people say, oh, he has never talked about corruption. 
probably that is why the idea of corruption is coming in. But I know that when you are looking at corruption, it's really not uh, going into the swamp to fight alligator. So I've always talked about draining the swamp. Draining the swamp. <laughs> and, and what this means for me is that the president put structure in place so that Nigeria can go full-blown e-governance. Our procurement process will be e-procurement so that there will be little human interference in the operations of government policies. Now, once we can achieve that and remove the corruption, we die naturally. The real reason the corruption subsists is that we have rejected e-governance for a very long time. People don't want to go on um, enterprise solutions. People just still want to do the normal thing so that you have to continue to clarify and then continue to seek rent and patronage from people who come for government services. Now, once these things are on the click of a button and everybody can assess it and everybody has a fair chance, and of course, artificial intelligence is determining who gets what, when and how, there will be sanity in the system. Now, that will drive motivation for people to pursue either interest in education, vocational study, because they know that you don't have to know anybody to be able to get any office. And once we can reach that level, a whole lot of sanity will come into the system and the economy will be robust. Okay, you just um, talked about the agenda that uh, President Bola Tinubu has for Nigeria, at least for the next uh, four years. But as we approach the first 100 days of his administration, let's look at those agendas. How many of them have been, uh, have we seen to a good extent the uh, work done in them. Uh, for food security, we know the government has plans, but let's look at job creation, which is one of the agenda. Uh, the, 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 this current administration plans to create one million jobs in the digital economy. Now, to that end, how much of uh, work have we seen on ground to ensure this happens in the next four years? We're, we're getting close to 100 days of his administration. Let's do some assessment here. Well, I, I, I have always argued that it's not the place of government really to create jobs. What government does everywhere in the world is create an enabling environment that will be conducive for private sector to blossom. And as private sectors are blossoming, you will see jobs being created. Because naturally, where you have good government in place and businesses are running, of course, no, not many people will want to see government uh, jobs. Uh, I want to take even government jobs as it were. Because what we have really right now is that we can't even pay those ones who work well. And that's one of the reasons a lot of people argue for issues that has to do with patronage and corruption or rent seeking within the system. Because the pay is small and it cannot actually take people home. Now, if Government can't even pay his work out. We're borrowing to pay salaries. And I don't think it's the place of government to actually. And I think what government is speaking to is that this is what government is saying. We're going to partner with the organized private sector. And the, the regime has made this very clear. Now, what's this level of partnership? He talks about this ICT partnership to create ICT hubs. Maybe replicating now what we have in the Yaba ICT hub, in the cis geopolitical space. Massive job will come from there. Because as you empower these people, then you see that they will be able to also employ people. You also think of industrialization. Take, for example, you go to Aba region, and you are having a lot of companies being empowered to produce things locally. We're looking at the CNG-driven cars being empowered and supported by government to be able to get people in. All of all these things will boost employment opportunity in the country. But I'm not thinking that the government is thinking of hiring more civil servants because that's not where we should be. Yes, of course, maybe within the police or the military sector where, of course, more hand will be needed to provide adequate security uh, and protection for lives and properties, that may be done. But of course, before we even get to that route, we have to first of all incentivize those who are already working mm -hmm. so that we can also attract good hand to come into that sector. But I think that um, using this uh, 
uh, 100 days kind of um, analysis for me is really neither here or there no. because government is not 100 days. A government is a budget life cycle. No. And so this budget is already running and the government inherited the budget. So there is little or nothing the government can actually do with an existing budget that is already running. So if we have to assess this government, we have to assess them based on its own budget, whose preparation has begun and probably will be passed in December. And then we will now be seeing what is going to be the item on the budget, what is government promising, and what are substantive action that government will need to take to ensure that they get to their goal. And I think that would be what would be fair to the regime. All right. Um, let me just look at um, the minister's you know, speech. Um, two segments there. One, he said, and I quote, we met a bad economy, and the promise of Mr. President is to make it better. They want to skip a particular process. Good. From bad to good to better should yes. be the order of the day. Yeah. This is very ambitious, some people will say. Then this, there comes the, the, the question of funding. Where will they get the funding from? Because he said here also that um, the present administration will not rely on borrowing as he had pledged. He, now referring to Mr. President, to be transparent, honest, and accountable to the people. So if they are not relying on borrowing, of course, there are tax um, tax options for them. What other areas are they looking at to you know get the funding they need to you know execute all these developmental ideas and um, legs of this administration if they are not borrowing? Yeah, th there's no doubt that of course um, they inherited a bad system, and it, it's just that sometimes we are not fair to those who govern us. Sometimes I sit down and I ask myself some very basic questions. Now, if you remember, since 2014, October 2014, when the cost of oil dipped, we went into a recession. And as at 2015 May, where the new government was being sworn in, many states in this country, the records are there, over 29 states could not pay civil servant salary. And the burden of that regime was to see how to bail out states to be able to pay salaries of their workers. And we seem to have overcome that. While we were thinking that problem was getting over, nobody expected COVID. COVID came. The whole world was shut down for six months. And how the government ran six months without revenue? In short, the price of the crude was on the negative because, of course, we were paying demolition on the sea, on the vessels that were on the sea. Now, these were real issues. We're not looking at those issues. Nobody is talking about them because they were natural issues. They were not man-made. And then all of a sudden, we thought that COVID was over. Then the pressure came from Russia, Ukraine war, which is putting pressure on grain and movement and all of all these things that has created a whole lot of crisis globally. Now, all of all these things are not man-made. They are not Nigerian produced. So these are the issues that we are dealing with as a people. Now, if we have to deal with these issues and we have to be objective about them, and I think people must realize that government inherited real, they were unlucky, so to speak. And now, what do you need to do is see how do we plan for a future. So what government is saying is, I don't want to borrow. And that was why Mr. President, on the day of his inauguration, he said, subsidy is gone. There's no money, so I won't borrow to buy for, for anybody. It's not going to happen. And I think that same thing that the minister is re -echoing. Now, what we are looking at is to see, how do we block the loopholes where funds are draining? How do we cut down on the cost of governance? We heard the president said yesterday that, look, people who are not meant to go to the United Nations General Assembly, they should not go. In other words, only officials of government that have business with that assembly should be in that meeting. Family friends should not be on that entourage so that the cost will go down for government. And I think if more of all these things are done, court costing measures are taken, we will see that some revenue will be freed up. Already, we are seeing some freed up because of the subsidy remover. 
And of course, uh, the last speech of the president to the nation, he told us that at least we have not been able to spend over almost a trillion for fuel subsidy in the last how many uh, one month. So these are the gains that you're going to get. Block up the loophole where these funds are draining, and then see how much you can actually muster to execute this particular budget until its life cycle in December 31st. And then you can now think of planning your own budget to run for 2024. And that's why I said that for an objective assessment of what the president will be able to do, he will be assessed based on his own budget, which is the 2024 budget, okay. not a 100-day in office. Okay. Now, still looking at um, the government not wanting to borrow uh, to get funds, the question still lies on where would the government get revenue from? Agreed, subsidy has been removed, but would that be sufficient to run the economy? And if it's not going to be sufficient, maybe the government is looking at taxing. How would that impact the businesses? Because part of the plan is to improve uh, playing field on which people and particularly businesses can operate. So taxation is one thing that we've known over the years has uh, been a problem for businesses. So how is the government going to navigate this, the, the issue of funding? Yeah, maybe, maybe I didn't make it very uh, plain. And I said um, in terms of government widening the tax net. Because if you look at the tax to GDP in Nigeria, it's the smallest almost everywhere in the world. So if you look at the 200 million people and the number of people who are taxable, you will see it's the, it's the smallest globally. A lot of people who play in the informal sector are not captured by their tax net. They are making some big money, but they are not taxed because they are not running formal structures. So these are issues, and this is what we're saying. Now, once you tidy up the entire system and you block where revenues are leaking, government will make more money. And don't forget that, of course, the, the president has also given a matching order to NFPCL that no more swap of our crude. What that means is that we will sell our crude, and we are going to make revenue coming from crude. Now, the operations of the Nigerian customs, for example, have also to be improved because, of course, and I think uh, kudos to customs because they have actually digitized their process of clearing. The revenue is coming in through the, crude, uh, through the customs. We are not mixing it. And, of course, it's coming into the COFA. So if government can account for its revenue, even the one that is coming in through the school system, of course, you see there's some increase in school system, which, of course, is also to cushion some of the effects on running the schools. Now, once we can aggregate all of all this together, there will be revenue in the interim to drive this process. And once government is able to actually set things in place, for example, the agriculture start to run. Take for example, if you plant rice today, it takes three months for harvest. If you plant corn, it takes three months for harvest. So which means in the next three months, if we can put money in these critical sectors and actually mechanize them, we can actually begin to see their reward if they are done well. Okay. Now, one other sector that is critical to um, the Nigerian economy is the health sector. But when people think about the health sector, most of the times, they, they think of it as a, a cost-draining um, sector. But then the Coordinating Minister of Health and Social Welfare, Ali Pate, said that uh, they will look at the critical sectors, uh, sections of the health value chain, the health value chain. Um, people think about, you know, health in the context of doctors and nurses. But then, within that, in between those two um, poles of the medical practice, are a lot of, you know, um, professionals there who constitute part of the health um, sector chain. He said they will look at that value chain and they will exploit the chain to improve the economy and create jobs for the people. Could you please speak more to this? Well, I, I think um, when you actually look at the reason why a lot of people go to seek medicals abroad, it's not really because of doctors. They go to seek medicals abroad because of diagnostics, which of course we have not done really excellent well in that region. Now, if you don't put so much money on diagnostics, a lot of people, of course, you have, uh, I, I remember some years ago, uh, one of uh, church members had a problem. And then, of course, it was uh, in Ibobi, and they thought that it was uh, uh, a, a bone problem. Until they take uh, him to London, they could not discover that it was actually cancer. Because we couldn't diagnose them. 
a lot of people are dying of avoidable death. And so the real reason why there are medical tourism, so to speak, that people are moving out of this place and they are going abroad to go seek this thing is because the diagnostic system, we have not been able to actually invest so much in it. Now, if you exploit that, of course, that people can actually know that you do, you do diagnosis here and you get good results. I even had cases where people have to send, where samples are sent today from Nigeria to South Africa for analysis. Some are sent to India. So all of all these issues have not been actually looked at closely. Now, if we put energy in this area, of course, our doctors are not short of knowledge to prescribe. But for them to do a proper prescription, the proper diagnosis had also to be done. Now, there's also another dimension of medicine, which is preventive medicine. We have also not invested in a whole lot of enlightenment that people know there are some certain things that they can do so that they don't get sick and pressure is not on the health sector. That's an industry on its own. Now, some years ago, uh, in the UAE, they discovered that, look, children were becoming obese. And it was costing government money to deal with obesity. Now they have to in introduce into their curriculum nutrition as a cause, wow. as preventive medicine. Now these are issues that, of course, you need to focus on. Now, if people are not sick, you won't spend more money uh, treating. We won't be focusing on curative. So there's also an industry around that that we should also have to focus on to see how do we prevent people from being sick. Now, once you are able to look at these value chains in terms of health uh, delivery, then you will have a good health system, and then you will be able to cope with the pressure that comes from those who will fall sick, because naturally, aging and the rest of it will also always lead people to be sick. And then there will not be so much pressure on the system, because a lot will be coming. And if we, have done, if we do that well, who says that people from our neighboring country won't come to Nigeria to also seek assistance, as we currently do to South Africa and to India and to Europe? Okay, now, uh, saying that we have uh, a very youthful population, uh, the Minister for Health and Social Welfare uh, said that the President envisions the idea of harnessing human capital for the youth population. Now, I know that one area the President is looking at is that of um, harnessing the, the youthful population towards the growth of the digital economy. But what other area can the, the government consider or should go hand in hand? Because... Again, we know that technology is the way to go, but not everybody can be techy. Yeah, but, but see, these are part of the issues, and that is what government is take, uh, need to also take on very, very quickly. Now, what most nations have done in time past to be able to really engage people to work is, of course, is uh, infrastructure development. And this is also a huge employer of labor. Because as long as you are building infrastructure, you see, for example, around surveying, around engineering, around building, a whole lot of economy will be developed. Now, we're also having issues not able to engage people because it's not just the engineers who are going to be on site that will be, uh, will be the people. Those who are selling building materials will be making profit. Now, if, the, if that industry is expanded, for example, now those who are making cement, they will be employing more hands to be able to meet up with the market demand because you are building infrastructure and you are investing wholly on infrastructure. Now, what this will mean is that people begin now to learn and develop competencies in these areas. And, and as they are growing their competencies in this area, then, of course, they are also being engaged. And then the economy, of course, and the redistribution of wealth is going around. And, uh, and like the president has promised, he can actually put an end to poverty. Now, I, I keep referring to my second Bible, which is uh, The Wealth of Nation by Ray Dalio. Uh -huh. Now, once you can increase the level of knowledge of a people, their productivity will skyrocket. And as uh, pro productivity increases, prosperity will come. So I think that's the area where we should be looking at. Let's have quality education 
which is critical. And, I, and I'm also hoping that the Minister of Education should speak to these issues. Because we're having so many people who go to school, really, and they are not really well educated. Because they are, they are in school to pass exam. And I think Nigeria must transition from merely passing exam to be able to actually apply whatever course they read. And then they use it usefully. I remember some uh, months back, and I was saying to my son, you see, all the people producing cream, all the people principles for producing soap, they are all uh, chemistry, yeah, elementary chemistry. <laughs> So how do we transition from just teaching our children chemistry in the secondary school to really actually empowering them that they can actually grow business out of chemistry, out of physics, even without being to the university? Now, I think this is where the educational system really needs to become real functional so that we can engage the youth and allow them to actually express themselves in terms of creativity. Another issue that, of course, the school system must deal with is that, you see, in Nigeria, many of our professors believe that students cannot contribute to knowledge until they become PhD. That's an error. And so, if you don't write what the lecturer gives to you in class, you are not sure to pass. There's no one way to eternity. There are multiple ways. So we should also allow children to express themselves, to challenge old assumptions. Mm -hmm. And as we challenge the other assumptions, you will see that, of course, creative energy will be steered up. Innovation becomes the order of the day. And then, of course, prosperity will follow. OK. Now, um, to achieve all this, there is need to be um, there is need for stability in the macroeconomic environment of the country because these things are not in isolation. I, I like your analogy of uh, not analogy your your submission on you know making education functional, where people to be to be sincere to to agree with you, all these things are elementary um, chemistry saponification. From secondary school you can produce soap, getting locally made materials. Now, but it's not happening because schools are not teaching us to be entrepreneurial at that particular age in life. But then let's leave the school system and let's, let's leave the Minister of Education alone now. How does the you know, present administration ensure a stable macroeconomic environment? Talk about inflation, talk about um, exchange rate and so on and so Of course, we've seen steps in that direction. But maybe you should just speak more to this. What should they look at? to ensure that we have that stable macroeconomic environment that can you know, attract investors, both um, from outside and even from within, to play. I, I, I think uh, those issues are already also spoken to by the eight points agenda, as you see. Now, let me point your attention to one of the issues that is raised on that. Now, what are the real basic issues that are fueling inflation, for example? In Nigeria, as we speak, the real thing that is falling food inflation, uh, falling inflation is commodity, food. That's what is falling inflation. Now, what's the problem with food? Is it that we are not producing enough, which of course the law of demand and supply, or issues that have to also do with logistics that are responsible for falling inflation in that regard? Now, this is a problem. How do we solve it? And that's what government is doing, food security. So if we have enough food, what will happen to inflation? It will go down. Now, you're talking about interest rate, for example. Mm -hmm. Why are the interest rates very high? Now, people are talking about the cost of procuring capital. And you know, recently, government really needs to look at commercial bank. We remember some years ago when Soludo came as our CBN, where he told that every bank should capitalize with about 25 billion. Are all the banks operating in Nigeria duly capitalized? CBA need to look at that. Because if you have 25 billion as a bank, and you are not able to uh, do business without 25 billion, and you are still talking about the cost of capital yourself, then there's a problem somewhere. So all of all those things are what government will need to clean up. 
And I think that the regime is looking at those issues because they know how these things work. That if banks are well capitalized, and then of course, because the only way banks make money is when you give loan to people and you recover the loan. And if you have an environment that of course the energy for productivity is, is steered up. People want to do business and they can get easy access to capital. And that was what the president spoke to on the eight point agenda. That one, worthwhile corruption is access to capital. Why people are not productive, they don't have access to capital. Now, once we can democratize that space, the people are having genuine assets to capital, what you will find is that these macroeconomic challenges that you are speaking to will be squarely taken care of. All right. Now, the uh, finance minister and coordinating minister for the economy, Wali Edun, has said that uh, the president has given marching orders um, to ministers to roll out policies and programs uh, within weeks to turn around the economy. So bringing that to, uh, in line with the eight-point agenda, what would be the role of the ministers since the, the big, big giving an order to make policies? What kind of policies should be the making now? Well, you see, I, I think that's a natural thing to do because when you look at the leadership, leadership, leadership school, there's this thing they speak about, leaders' right strategy. And to say, this is the vision, this is where we're going to. Now, it is the role and responsibility of the managers to put one and one together to see how we can get to that point. The, the president has said he wants the GDP to grow at 6%. Now, the Ministry of Health will say, look, what is my contribution to the 6%? Oh. The Ministry of Solid Mineral will come and say, how do I contribute to the 6%? The Ministry of Agriculture will say, oh, how much is my percentage that will come to make this 6%? Now, they should be able to sit down and look at where values are going to come from and put a plan on the table. What is their own contribution to the 6% GDP growth? Now, if you look at, for example, just the solid mineral, and enough policies are made in there to clean up that space also, they can actually contribute up to 1% to GDP. And I think this is what it is. So president is asking his managers now, draw up your KPIs, the things we are going to appraise you with at the end of the day. And that was why Jiri told us the other day and said, of course, President Bo uh, Tinubu is not afraid to sack anybody. Because if you are not measuring up, then you don't have any business occupying any space in the ESCO chambers. So everybody now has to prove themselves that's okay, I can contribute. Otherwise, then they bring in somebody else who can do better and make these things work. Now he's saying, you go back, go and draw a plan and tell us how you can help us achieve our goal, which is what every leader will do. And I think that is uh, a step in the right directions.